Today is Tuesday, December the 5th, 2018. The location is Fox Run Village in Novi, Michigan. The time is 11 a.m. The person being interviewed is Ralph Schneider. Ralph served in the United States Army 3rd Armor Division during World War II. The interview will be conducted by Dan Nehal. Also present at this interview will be the videographer, Gary Delisle, Dean Gilbert, Ralph's wife Dottie, and his daughter Carol. This interview is being conducted on behalf of the Oral History Project at the Yankee Air Museum in Belleville, Michigan. How are you today, Ralph? I'm fine, That's thank good. you. And can you tell me when you were born? I was born June 6, or June 7, 1926. And where were you born? I was born on a farm country in Illinois, about 90 miles south of Chicago. Okay. And were your parents born in this country? Yes. And what were their names? My father's name was William, born in Detroit. And my mother's name was Louise Wickbolt, born in Chicago. And did you have any brothers or sisters? Yes, I had uh, two sisters and a brother. What were their names? My sisters were Eleanor, the oldest, and the next sister was Loretta. She was next in line. And then I came and then my brother, Arthur. Okay. And what did your father do for a living initially? My father was a parochial school teacher, a Lutheran school teacher in Illinois. Can you talk about what his duties were in this job and how much he, w he was paid? Certainly, yeah. It's quite a story because at that time we had no electricity or anything. And he had a one-room school, taught 40 children or plus 40 in all seven grades in one room. And uh, they all turned out well. And how much did he make? $85 a month, plus a cow, and some chickens, and five acres of land. Can you talk a bit about your father's vision about things like language and government? Yes, I'm very happy to do that because my father taught in this German community. And his main role that he took on for himself was to convince these hard-headed German farmers to come to a, the American way of doing things, language and the way they, you live in America. His motto was, you now live in America, act like it and live like it, and speak the American language, which was a tough thing to do. And they, they had trouble um, accepting the government too? They didn't accept it, they just didn't understand it and were so deep in their own way of things that it took a lot of conversion, let's call it that. Did you learn to speak German at home? I learned to speak German in school. My father would not let us speak German at home. He wanted us to speak English so English was the language in the home. In school, like I was confirmed in German. Did your mother work outside the home? No, she had enough to do. And you said you grew up in rural Illinois. What, what town was that? Well, the closest town was Cisna Park. Had a population of about 600 at that time and probably 599 now. <laughs> but it was six miles from our home, closest okay. town. And you said that was about 90 miles from Chicago, is that right? We were about 90 miles south of Chicago. What was it like growing up in rural Illinois? And can you talk about the living conditions? Yes, I'd be happy to because I'm probably one of the few people left who grew up in a home that had no electricity, had no inside toilets, 
or water or any of the conveniences that you have today. It was rural with no benefits at all. Were your brother and you close when you were growing up? Oh yes, we were close. Did you do things to get, did you do things like trapping and things like that in the, on the farm? For a couple of years, uh, he and I had a trap line. Uh, we had to walk about a mile and a half through the f fence line, use the fence line to get there because usually it was dark. And uh, we weren't too successful, but I would say we probably learned a lot. What are your memories when your house w was electrified? That a memory I'll probably never forget. If you can imagine a young man sitting around the kitchen table with a kerosene lamp and then suddenly lights go on. Quite a thrill. And was the whole was the whole area electrified at the same time? Yes, through the rural electrification program. So when they turned the juice on, the whole neighborhood lit up. That must have been something to see. Well, we were not that close to the neighbors, but uh, there quite a few things happened. Did you attend school with your with your father then? Oh yes, for seventy seven grades. And you transferred to another school before high school? Yes, uh, we had to take our eighth grade training in a uh, school called Prairie Dell, total enrollment of nine. <laughs> and the oh. teacher was probably uh, two years older than those for the rest of us. But, but there was typical farm area public school at that time. How far was that from your home? That was about three miles and I rode the bicycle as long as the weather was okay and after that I walked okay. or ride the bike as far as I could and dump it along the roadside and walk the rest of the way. When you went to high school at Cessna Park, how many students were in that high school? The Sister Park High School, at that time I was there in my freshman and sophomore years only. The total enrollment was about 130, 135. Talk about when your family moved and, and where you went to high school after that. Yeah, we moved uh, in early 44 because my dad couldn't live on the salary he was getting. So he went to Detroit and got a job at Vickers in a war plant. And uh, was the rest of that question? Well, it was uh, talk about the, the high school that you went to and when you moved. Well, the, when we moved then from uh, uh, Cisna Park to Detroit, I was then just to begin my junior year high school. So I was six weeks into the term when I got to Detroit. So I moved from a high school of 125, 30 students to one around 3,000. Oh, Lord. And if you want to be shocked, that was it. Dumb farmer kid with all the city kids pulling tricks on you. Now, when your dad, your dad moved, he left the family down in Illinois to, to take care of things and wrap up to make a move. Is that... What happened? Yeah, he, as soon as his school year ended in June or end of May, he went to Detroit to see if he could get a job. And he got the job, stayed right there. So my brother and I and sister and mother had to, we had an auction to get rid of our cow and chickens and stuff. They weren't going to go to Detroit and uh, moved to Detroit. Okay. Did you play sports in high school? Yes, I did. I loved uh, baseball. To, to, I enjoyed it, did pretty well. Okay. Do you remember where you were when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Oh, yes. 
I was in a, the uh, gym of our school in Cisna Park High School, and I can recall the principal, Principal Anderson, calling a, a, uh, a, a, all the students together to tell us about the war. Uh, the, the attack attack was on Sunday, and there was at our church a uh, ladies' uh, sale or something, and the kids were all out playing when we heard that the attack happened in Pearl Harbor. Didn't think much of it till we got to high school, and we're. And I know a couple of us were sitting up in the bleachers and kind of giggling. And I can remember the principal, Anderson, saying, and you guys might be in it. And he was so right. What grade were you in when, in high school when you heard about when Pearl Harbor happened? I was starting my junior year. OK. So when did you graduate from high school in Detroit? What, what year and month? 44, June of 44. And did you get drafted right away, or? Yes, I was drafted in August, '44. And when you got drafted, where did you get processed into the army? Fort Sheridan, Is Illinois. Illinois. Uh, then we were uh, transported by train. We didn't know where, but we ended up in Georgia. Do you have any memories of the train trip? Oh yeah, that was, first of all, being on a train was a new thing. And uh, we're a bunch of recruits in his car and it got hot, so we decided to open the windows of the train to cool off. Well, night came and we went to sleep and the darn train went through a tunnel and we woke up in the morning black as could be, <laughs> and yet no water or anything to <laughs> clean ourselves. So when we arrived in, in uh, Georgia, we were looking like, you, you can imagine, black and blue and, and uh, a mess. So you went to infantry training in Georgia then? Is that yes, Camp Wheeler, Georgia, which was a Infantry Replacement Training Center, I Macon, love, Georgia. I love the name Replacement Training. It's well, it has a unique connotation. Yes. Because you're trained to go to the front line as soon as you finish your 16 weeks of training. And what was going on in the war when you were in training at that time? Well, the significant thing was in the 14th week of our training cycle was the Malmandary ma Massacre. And since we were infantry retracement training, every day we were briefed on the front line action in Europe and in the Pacific. When the Malmandary Massacre occurred, we immediately left bivouac threw our gear in the back end of a truck and forced marched back to our billets getting ready to go overseas. We then, uh, I, I was getting ahead of myself here, then uh, okay. we laid around for a couple of days because the weather and the army in their good, good goodness, decided to fly us home for, for Christmas. By then the Battle of the Bulge was raging and we we're going to get a three-day pass at Christmas. But the weather got bad and uh, each day we lined up in front of the terminal, air terminal in Macon, to board the Army plane but because of the weather, we couldn't. And they lined us up in front of the, the terminal, and this one night, the second night we did that, 
they started playing Christmas music, and we everybody booed so loud they turned it off. <laughs> so the, on the, the actually the day after Christmas, we finally boarded the army plane and flew to Detroit. We could see the clouds ahead of the snowstorm and we got to Detroit. The uh, pilot said, we're going to circle Detroit so you can get a good look at it. And it was right after the five inch snow that had held us up. And uh, it was one of the most beautiful sights you wanted to see as he circled Detroit. When we landed at what is now the Willow Run Airport, Romulus, the plane couldn't even taxi. The snow was so deep it just landed and boom, stopped. <laughs> Army trucks came out to the, to the plane and on the back of the truck, these are open trucks, just canvas top, which said what route they were taking into Detroit. So I got on the bus that said Michigan Avenue to downtown, because that was closest to my home. We uh, took off in this open truck, well, it had a canvas cover, that's all, open in the rear. And I can recall driving, slushing along through the snow and Finally, somebody said, Junction Avenue. Well, that's my place close to home. So the truck already started. I threw my barracks bag out over the back end of the truck and jumped out after it. So here I am about 4 o'clock in the morning, lying in the middle of Junction <laughs> and Michigan Avenue, on my back wondering where I'm going next. <laughs> I pulled over or walked over with my barracks bag to the curb, standing there, wondering what to do next. Now, some guy says, you need a ride, soldier? Here was a taxi pulled up. I can recall saying, well, all I got is two bucks in my pocket. He said, get in. <laughs> Took me home. One of the most beautiful sights I saw when I opened the front door about five o'clock in the morning or so. Here's the Christmas tree still sitting there. Great thought. Uh, we had then spent three days at home and uh, then headed out toward uh, Fort Meade to get equipped for overseas. Was, I'm talking here yeah. too much. Was it was that the trip to Boston then? Then we we got Fort Meade. We got winter clothes, a new rifle, and uh, then we went to Boston, where we boarded the Isle de France. Went across the Atlantic in record time, without an escort. They had one submarine alert, but no problem and uh, landed in Glasgow. Immediately, we, we got into the Glasgow Harbor. They closed the harbor with a submarine net to keep the German subs out. And in the harbor, having made the similar trip that we did where the, uh, the Queen Mary, uh, the uh, Queen Elizabeth, we all loaded with troops, headed for the, res the Battle in, of the Bulge, and which was started by the Battle of the Bulge. Those ships were so fast that they didn't need escorts, is that correct? That's right. And they, they changed direction every couple minutes or seconds, I don't know. They, they just weaved across at full speed, made it in record time. I think we took it in five and a half days or something. Immediately after landing, they had the nets on the side of the ship. We climbed down the nets into little barges onto a uh, 
trains that was already lined up. And we get in the train and off we went to Liverpool. Immediately, oh, I might say, well, on that train, we got the, the British people came down the line with, with some goodies to eat. And boy, we really appreciated that limey food because <laughs> on that ship was terrible. But anyway, that helped us out. Got to Liverpool, immediately got on a, a smaller ship across the channel to La Havre and boarded a 40 and 8 train. 40 and 8 is that old World War I uh, a box car that would carry 40 people or eight horses. That's where the name came from. And we had a deluxe one. When we got in it and laid on the straw with our barrack bags, we looked up and it had been strafed, so we had an air conditioned one. <laughs> there and we could see the snow coming through what? in the in the car. What did the Laharve look like when you when you landed? It was a, it was just a, a wreck, a rumbles. Just they, they, what it looked to me like they plowed a route to go in and out, and all the damage was still there. And how did you get to um, from or where did you go from Laharve? Then you went on. Well, we, by train went to Luxembourg. I might say we stopped one night in the train and they said, we're in Paris. Whoopie doo, we're in this <laughs> cattle car and on the outskirts of Paris. But then we ended up next morning or wherever in Luxembourg, which was the third army, not our artillery, like you said earlier, third army headquarters. And then third army then we were split to go to the division. Loaded us on, again, open trucks. Carried us to the 90th Division headquarters. Then we went on again in open trucks. <coughs> and they were open so you could bail out in case we're strafed up into Bastogne. And we were the replacements at Bastogne. It had just been relieved by Patton's 4th Armor Division. And uh, we went in as replacements. One of the, the squad I joined, infantry, had ridden Patton's tanks to get into relief of, of Bastogne. What did, what did the countryside look like as you traveled through on the trucks going to Bastogne? I mean, well, what we could see, we saw debris and snow. We had a lot of snow those days. The one turn that I remember was right near Bastogne, or maybe on the edge of Bastogne were the bodies that I picked up, frozen, stacked. And there were two stacks, one stack German, one stack American. I kind of looked at those stacks and I said to myself, I got a chance. It looks like it's eight to one. <laughs> so that's a, one of the thought, one of the, <laughs> things you see on the way in. But we saw a lot of wreckage, damage. Uh, when we got to the outskirts of Bastogne, we could look out over the field, tanks facing each other, wiped out, bodies lying there with their frozen arms up, frozen legs or something, out and still out in the field. Uh, they hadn't been able to collect them all. What were that was the first sight. What were your first days on the front line like? Well, I, I would like to say this because of replacements. 
half of the replacements that arrived at Bastogne when we got out of the trucks were so frozen that half of them had to be evacuated within days. The rest of us got assigned to uh, uh, fighting units. I was in the 90th Infantry and uh, that night, first night, laid in a barn. They took us from Bastogne to some little barn outside of Bastogne, which I assume was the front line at night, crawled in and sitting around little fires in this barn were the survivors of the guys that relieved Bastogne. We were introduced by the sergeant and none of them, they sat there, looked in their fire, and they'd say, hi, that was it. We laid bunk down on the floor with a blanket. Sometime late at night, maybe early morning, I don't know, uh, the guy next to me was a replacement. They picked him to go on patrol. He never came back. We assumed the patrol was captured. Then we shoved off the next morning for our first assignment. Now when they issued you your rifle, the rifle was probably packed in grease, right? When you got to Bastogne, was it functioning? Did you have a chance to no. clean it? It was Cosmoline. Cosmoline. And we carried it right up. It wouldn't work, so we just dropped it and found somebody that lost his and used that. But what happened when your commander found out that you spoke some German? Well, that at that point now we reached Germany and uh, I was sort of the unofficial, unofficial interpreter, even though I was a private, uh, for the company. Uh, it meant a couple of things, and, and uh, 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 this I'm proud of, because of that I could help out to prevent some nasty situations. I can, I'll tell you one, uh, this night we were moving forward, came to a farmhouse where we were hiding, and I've, I'll deviate a bit. I, I come, the CO wanted somebody to volunteer to go into that farmhouse and clear out, see if there's any German soldiers in there. And I can remember this very clearly. Finally, a guy by the name of Pincus said, give me a grease gun and open those windows. And they said, there's wooden shutters, no, no glass. Opened them and he took a running jump with his grease gun through the window into the house. And after a little while, he came out with two German prisoners with his grease gun in their back. That I have to tell you because that's the kind of uh, guys we had in our company. Can, can that you night, that same place, I had the opportunity to, evidently, I think they were the farmers or the owners of the place showed up, very excited. So the company commander called me over and said, what do they want, you know? My German wasn't all that good, but I finally f figured out they're talking about fresh straw. Fresh straw in the winter time, snow on the ground. And so we started looking and started to get daylight. And as it got daylight, we could see out there about three, four hundred yards. Looked like fresh straw. 
Well, right. So this company commander had a fire an 88 shell into it, and that straw went flying along with a couple of German soldiers, and it revealed a German 88 emplacement aimed right at our house. They got one round off, and the next round, that did it. That morning, we crossed that whole open area to uh, take the town. So I felt pretty pretty good about that. Can you tell us the story about uh, what happened to your buddy that had bunked next to you in Camp Wheeler? Well, yeah. As we took this town along the Prune River, uh, we were about in the last house to be taken. He was at the lower floor and I was in the upper floor. And uh, the, the old time, time GI with me said, don't silhouette yourself in front of that window. So I crawled under it. My buddy was one floor down and uh, he happened to expose himself and a machine gunner out there let him, killed him. That, he was the guy that had the bunk next to me in basic training. So again, an old timer saved my life by saying, look, because as soon as we passed through that window or got beyond it, he opened fire and the whole, splattered the whole back wall of the place. Now you ended up carrying a, a Browning automatic rifle or a BAR as it was called. Uh, were you trained for this and how did that come we about? We had some limited training and basic training and firing a BAR, yes. And it's a Browning automatic rifle. It's very heavy. And how did you end up, uh, how did you end up carrying it? What, what happened? What transpired? Well, this one particular night, uh, we were assigned to ride tanks on one of Patton's pushes. And I was given the BAR to stand on the back end of the turret of the tank looking for, for uh, snipers. That was my job. As the tank, the lead tank went down the road, we went, I don't know, 30 miles that day, something like that. So were the, 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 the guys that carried the BARs, were they special targets of the Germans? Oh yes, uh, nobody wanted to re really carry them. And that's why some of us recruits got, got them <laughs> because the Germans knew what a BAR was. And if they could get a line on a BAR guy with a BAR, he's the first guy to go. Can you talk about your experience crossing the Moselle? The Moselle or the Rhine? The Moselle. Moselle. Uh, that was my river crossing. Uh, we uh, got into these little boats that the engineers had already placed. They have no seats. You get on your knees and paddle across. And that night we got some fire, but it was over our heads. I think the crossing of the Rhine was, to me, a bigger event. One that I think ought to be written up more frequently was Patton's Third Army going across the Rhine. And we, our company started out, well, I, I got a look at the Rhine the day before because the CEOs said, let's go for this Jeep ride. And we went through the woods and looked over a ridge and here was the line, Rhine, flat as could be. He says, better turn around and get out of here. 
So he turned around and the Germans started firing some mortars. Since I was on the back end of his Jeep looking backwards, I could see the rounds coming. <laughs> but that was the beginning of the Third Army crossing of the Rhine. And that next morning, the CO was right. We were going to cross it. Fortunately, the 5th Division, which my uncle was in, my uncle Bing, crossed it in assault boats and got a bridgehead. During the day then, the engineers were building a w bridge to get the troops across along then tanks. We marched, almost forced march all day from where we were hiding in the woods through the woods, didn't know where we were headed. But as we marched here along the road, in the, in the, the hiding in the trees with anti-aircraft guns, Higgins boats, landing craft, anything you could use to fight a war. It turned out the whole Third Army had come right to that spot to break through into Germany. Well, our company marched through all of this, and as we clo got closer to the Rhine, I can remember generals directing traffic. In fact, one of them stood there and gave us an orange and said, keep going. <laughs> and we did. And the engineers had a footbridge built, completed, at least good enough for to walk, and we walked right across the Rhine. As we did, two German planes came to strafe us, and uh, one of them got shot down real quick, and the other one took off, I don't know. But then we got across, uh, relieved the 5th Division, held the ground until the bridge could be completed and the tanks come. And then this whole army, the third army, branched out from there. Now there was a pontoon bridge, is that correct? Yes. Okay. There are, well, the Corps of Engineers had these pontoons and then they put wood on top and you walk across. So I walked across the Rhine. So just to be clear, this was not the famous uh, crossing at Remagen. This is No, this it was is downstream. Different. Yeah. It doesn't get as many headlights, but, but I have to tell you that from a logistic standpoint, uh, it, it should get a lot of attention because here's a whole third army lined up in the woods, ready to cross, and they did as soon as the, the bridge got, the tanks could get across. Can you describe the events surround your being wounded and the treatment you received immediately after? Yeah, I, we had crossed the Mainz River and I was on patrol to look for a command post in this little village that we had taken, I thought we had taken. And an, another GI and, and I got the assignment to look for a, a command post. Well, evidently, we got in the part of town that was not under control. And we took fire from the left. And as I, as the fire came from the left, I spotted two Germans coming around a building on the right. I went over and covered them. And as I reached to the rifleman to, to disarm him, like he was disarmed anyway, I guess. I got hit and fortunately, the second guy I was trying to capture was a medic. And he gave me first aid in the middle of the street uh, with fire coming. He didn't flinch. I was bleeding like a stuck pig, and he stopped the bleeding, gave me to save my life. 
Never had a chance to even say thank you to him. Uh, the fellow I was with had the two Germans carry me into the house there, lay me on the floor, and said, guard them until get me out of there. Six hours later, the medics and the army showed up and took the two prisoners and took me to the hospital. Can you describe the medical treatment you received in England? Yes, uh, it was very good. Uh, I was in, I, I had to wait a few days to gain some strength before they could operate. And in that time I had a lot of pain. So they built a cage over me because these are wooden barracks, it's the hospital, yeah. and the shook. So they built a cage over me and they'd stand back until the time came to be operated on. They called in a specialist from some place. Uh, later on I heard he was a specialist out of New Brooklyn, New York. Of course I never saw him, saw his face. I was given a spinal and that meant I could to put a towel over you, but I could see underneath. <laughs> so I could see the hands working on, on my hip and then it was like a thump. I, and I popped off saying, what's going on here? I thought they were taking my leg off. They said, no, we're just chiseling the bull out, bullet out of your hip, oh, out of your hip bone. And they said, I, peeking underneath, and I could see the doctor hand the nurse something. She went over to the sink, washed it off, and she said, here's a sir souvenir, <laughs> which I still have. You still have that? Yeah. My daughter does. <laughs> How did you get back from England to the States, and do you have any memories of the trip? Of what? Of the trip to the States. And yeah, that was an interesting trip. Again, I was on the Aquitania, which was a hospital ship. And before you are evacuated from England, they wrap you up in what we called level A. In my case, I was wrapped from my right toe all the way up to my chest, down to my here, in, just wrapped, couldn't move because they didn't want you to get hurt. And then they carried you into the a spot on the ship, the Aquitania. But the interesting part of that trip was two things. One is Fleming, the developer of penicillin, happened to be on that ship. Huh. So he came down into our area and he was introduced as the, the uh, developer of penicillin. So that was kind of an interesting thing. And then the most exciting was, as we entered New York Harbor, every fireboat and our salute was shooting water in the air and noise you couldn't believe as the ship entered New York Harbor. Well, here we are, as wrapped up as we are, fell out of our booths, actually had to almost fall out, worked our way to the porthole to see this. We made it, and the ship started to list, and the captain got after us <laughs> to get back. Where, well, we couldn't get back in our bunks, but we got out. But it was quite a sight. When they unloaded us, unloaded the Aquitania to take us to Holleran Hospital, the military had lined up ambulance after ambulance. The whole city of New York stood still. Wow. And we were escorted. 
but the thought I can remember is people standing there just in awe. So are we. But it was quite a thrill. Where did you go next after New York, and do you have any memories of that trip? Yeah, I have memories. I got a lot of them. <laughs> uh, we were loaded onto a hospital train that left New York, and we ended up in Temple, Texas. That's a several day tour. And the thing I remember about that trip was, again, we were all put in bunks, couldn't move. We were not allowed to get out of the bunk. And they had a poor nurse, a young gal, cute little thing. And she'd go down, these old GIs, they had more reasons to put that nurse to work, you know. So she took the rest of my bunk, because I was at the end, lower bunk, and she could sit on the end of my bunk and look down the aisle away from, to help the guys. But that, these are old time veterans, and they were veterans. I was a young kid. And I think that's why she picked on me. I was still green behind the ears. <laughs> and these old guys always had some reason to call her. I remember that part very well. Uh, Temple, Texas is a, a uh, was an army hospital that specialized in amputations. Most of the people there were head amputations. I didn't. I was sent there to just recuperate. A few lines of story there. I went this because this is an important one to me. I was going with my crutches down to the swimming pool to get my some therapy. And they were choosing up sides for a softball game. So I asked the sergeant if I could get in the game, because I love softball. And he said, oh, yeah. He said, go out to third base. So I go out there, standing there. Game's about ready to start. He says, sorry, uh, you, you can play in this game. I said, well, why not? He says, look around. You got both legs and arms. <laughs> Everybody had something missing but me. So it taught me a lesson. I didn't qualify, but just look around and you'll see you're not so bad off. That lesson I'll never forget. After you uh, arrived in Texas, you went home on leave. Uh, can you tell us about that trip home? Uh, the one I'll, two trips. The one I'll tell you about is the one that I was being transferred from McCloskey, or the hospital in Texas, to Percy Jones for discharge. Still on crutches, uh, and we were on a civilian train and there were about four of us either crutches or something wrong they, and we had to wear our uniform and our medals on this private plane train well we were this one evening we we're going along and something's going on everybody was happy and as we went through this town, we could see big celebration out in the street. And finally, it, it was the end of World War II. And there were the big celebrations. That was the Japanese surrender? Yeah. And we were in the, this car, about five of us, GIs, all people walked by, not one said a word. It's, it's interesting. It's just, they just didn't know what to say. Yeah. We were happy. <laughs> Did you ever consider staying in the Army? 
well, I couldn't. I never considered it, but th they wouldn't. I was d discharged for disability. Okay. Okay. What did you do after you were discharged? Well, I was fortunate, very fortunate. I was the interface, put it this way, between a company called AM General and the Army. AM General was a, and what's left over of the Willys Motors Jeep. We inherited the Jeep and any military production, anything that was paid with a federal stamp or federal dollar. My job for the company was, as I said, the interface. That meant I handled the contracts, did the negotiation, prepared the bids. We ended up supplying 90% of the, and get this right, tactical wheeled vehicles used in Vietnam. Kind of proud of that. The last project that was on, which I'm also proud of, is the Humvee, the Hummer. We designed it. The, the chief designer is a fellow by the name of George Charbach, an engineer who grew up in the, the Jeep mode. He grew up in Toledo, worked at Jeep plant, became an engineer, and always had that army in mind. So when it came time to design the Hummer, there's no shortcuts. He put everything into the Hummer that the army wanted at that time. Fortunately, he and I were good friends and worked together, and uh, I'm, I'm proud of that. To go back a little bit, after you were discharged, uh, did you go to college? I went to Michigan State okay. under the uh, Public Act 16, it was called, Rehabilitation Program for the Army. Very, very fortunate. And, and what degree did you get there? A ba bachelor of administration, okay. BA. Uh, how many children did you have, and, and where are they now, and what are their names? I have uh, three children. One sitting right here, Carol. She's the youngest. Very proud of her. She has her own business in the travel agency here in Dearborn. The oldest is my son. Stephen lives in the Chicago area, and uh, he's retired. That's a big shock. Retired uh, from uh, Northern Trust. He became a vice president of Northern Trust. And that's one of the big shocks of your life is when your son calls you up and says, Dad, I'm retiring. <laughs> Shook me up. And my other daughter, the middle one is uh, Deborah Jean, who is in Cambodia. She went to Thailand originally to help the people get uh, organized as a independent, bring people up to do their thing rather than on, under some big mogul. As an example, she gets the people to, uh, that ran the rickshaws, the guys to pool their money and get their own rickshaw, and then eventually get their own business so they weren't under a mogul. Mm -hmm. That's how she started. She's done many wonderful things in Thailand and now in Cambodia with her husband. She got married when she was in Thailand. A college uh, acquaintance went over there and found her and proposed. And they've been over in that area all these years. They now are 
they were with Food for the Hungry for a number of years. And the uh, it's a inner not an inner denomination, but a, a church out of Hope, Michigan, whatever that church is that has Hope College. Okay. They're affiliated with them. And uh, their retirement will be with that organization. They now run a Bible school in Cambodia, which is very successful. I'm trying to talk her to come home. But I guess she's going to stay. If, if you had to say something to the youth growing up today about your experiences, what would it be? The first thing I would say, go to church, have faith in the Lord, because he still rules. And that is, would be my advice today. Then, you do what you got your God-given gifts, use them to the best that you can. That's about all I could say. Okay. But it stems from having a strong faith in the Lord. And I thank the Lord for all the things that happened to me. I don't have anything else, Ralph. It's been a pleasure talking to you today. Well, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you.